Hi, Grade 8s. This is our first video for our Structures and Mechanisms Unit. For Grade 8, the focus for this strand is Systems in Action. Before we can move on in this unit, we need to know, in scientific terms, what actually is a system? When we're talking science, a system is a set of parts or processes that work together to carry out a specific job or task. Seems pretty straightforward, right? What makes it complicated, though, is that many different kinds of things can be considered systems. For example, take a shopping cart. It can be thought of as a system that holds and transports groceries as you move about the store or helps you carry groceries out to your car. What about a cell phone? It can be thought of as a system that lets you make and receive phone calls and texts, play games, and listen to music, among other things. Our healthcare system, which is huge, and is made up of so many different parts, the doctors and nurses and orderlies, the equipment and the technology, the buildings, the vehicles, all of this makes up a system that helps keep you and me healthy. Even a tree can be thought of as a system. It functions to take in carbon dioxide and let off oxygen, and it provides homes and food for birds and other animals. To make it easier for you to understand and remember all the different types of systems, we can sort or classify them using a tree diagram. The category at the top of the diagram contains all of the systems that have ever or will ever exist. We can divide all of these systems into two subcategories, physical systems and social systems. Let's talk about physical systems first. A physical system is a set of physical parts or components that work together to carry out a job or task. So in other words, physical systems are made up of parts that we can touch, see, or measure in some way, and they all work together to do a particular job. A social system, on the other hand, involves a group of living creatures. Now, these can be human or non-human, but what's important is that these living creatures are interacting with each other and performing tasks. Now, I have to make it clear, I'm not saying that social systems don't have physical components. They can, and they often do, but the key feature of such a system is that it is made up of living creatures, and these living creatures have relationships and interact with each other. Both physical and social systems can be broken down into even smaller groups, depending on whether they are natural or human-made. Now we're going to look at a few examples to make this even clearer. Let's start with natural physical systems. When we say they're natural, it means that we humans didn't design them, we didn't build them or create them. A system in this category can exist with or without us. Examples would be the solar system or the circulatory system. The last example sometimes confuses people. They often think that something like the human circulatory system should be considered human-made. After all, it's in our bodies. The key factor here is that we didn't consciously design or build this system. Without us thinking about it at all, it just develops when we're babies in our mother's wombs. That's what makes it a natural system. The second group of physical systems are what we would call human-made. A physical system of this type only exists because it was deliberately designed and built by humans. Specific examples would be a laptop or an airplane. But such systems don't actually need to be that complicated or complex. Something as simple as a manual can opener is a human-made physical system. Just like for physical systems, there are also two kinds of social systems. 
a natural social system would be made up of a group of non-human living creatures working together with different roles and relationships. And this type of system would exist whether or not humans were around. Examples of this type of system would be a bee colony or a wolf pack. Try to come up with a couple more examples yourself. For human-made social systems, you still have living creatures interacting and working together, except this time, as the name suggests, the living creatures are humans. A great example that you'd be familiar with from grade seven and eight music is a band or orchestra. As this example shows, such a social system can have physical parts. In this case, things like the sheets of music, the conductor's baton, and the instruments. But it is the relationships between the different members that are important. Specifically, each person is playing a particular instrument and may even be playing at different times. We would also have the conductor keeping time with his or her baton and signaling if the group should be playing loudly or softly. And it's these interactions or relationships between people that allows this system to carry out its function, playing a piece of music. Another example of a human-made social system would be a classroom or a school. Again, you have a number of different human beings that would play a role in this system, the principal, the teachers, and the students, and they all have particular jobs and interact together to carry out the function of educating students. Now, although we will talk about the other kinds of systems, our main focus for this unit will be human-made physical systems. This is simply because such systems are easier to observe and manipulate in our science lab at school. Such systems also play an important role in making our day-to-day -day lives much easier. One way that such systems help us is by letting us complete jobs way more quickly than we would normally be able to do. For example, using heavy machinery, which are human-made physical systems, a farmer can plow and plant a large field by him or herself. Without the machinery, this would take much longer, and it might not even be possible. Human-made physical systems also help us carry out tasks that we would never be able to do on our own because we're just not strong enough to generate the amount of force needed to lift or move something. For example, in warehouses, you'll often see forklifts being used to transport heavy crates. One person might not be strong enough to lift and move a crate by him or herself, but is able to carry out the same job using a forklift. Now, just to keep your life interesting, it turns out that human-made physical systems can be further broken down into even smaller categories based on the type of energy needed for them to operate. This isn't a complete list, but just to give you an idea, here are a few examples. There are mechanical systems which rely on mechanical energy to function, and an example of that type of system would be a bike. We also have optical systems which rely on light energy to work, and an example of that would be any type of camera. Finally, we also have electrical systems which rely on, you guessed it, electrical energy, and in fact, most of the appliances in our homes would fall in this category. I've just chosen to show you one, an electric mixer for baking. The last thing to understand about systems, and this is true of all systems, not just human-made physical systems, is that all systems have inputs and outputs. An input is anything going into a system that allows it to function. So an input could be some type of energy, a force, or necessary raw materials. An output is what comes out of the system. In other words, it's the job or service that is provided or completed by the system. Unfortunately, many systems also have what we call side effects. On the last slide, we talked about outputs, and there what we were actually talking about were the intended or desired outputs. In other words, we were talking about what the system is meant or designed to do. 
Side effects are actually unintended or undesired outputs. They are things that come out of or are produced by a system that we really didn't plan on or didn't want to happen. I've just thrown a whole lot of terms at you, so let's work through them with a specific example of a human-made physical system, a car. For a car to function, it needs certain inputs, for example, gasoline and a driver. It also has certain outputs. These are the things we want it to do. For example, the car is able to move allowing us to travel distances faster than we would be able to do on foot and without getting tired. It also has storage space, so another output might be that it helps us carry items like our groceries or our musical instruments. However, as useful as cars are, they do have side effects. For example, since most cars burn fossil fuels, they have exhaust, which contributes to air pollution. As well, they aren't silent, so many cars together can be quite loud and cause what we call noise pollution. We've come to the end of our introduction to systems. A quick look at the references and resources used in the making of this video, and that's it. Bye for now.